Hello and welcome to the fifth video of our Animating with Spine series. Once more, we dig deeper into another of the 12 animation principles. This time, we'll be exploring squash and stretch. The early Disney animators called squash and stretch the most important discovery they made when they established the 12 principles. Now, the times have changed. Most beginner animators are already familiar with these concepts. We have been surrounded by animation constantly since we were babies, so even an absolute beginner will know to squash their characters when applying force to it. Let's see how to do it properly. Most commonly, you will use squash and stretch to deform characters and objects to exaggerate motion or show impact. It helps convey weight and elasticity. Squash and stretch describe how an object changes shape in response to forces acting on it. Squash is when an object is compressed by an impact or an opposing force. Stretch is when an object is extended by something pulling on it or by moving quickly. When applying squash and stretch, it's very important that the overall size of the object doesn't become larger or smaller. If you squash or stretch in one direction, stretch or squash in the other to keep the same volume. Also, think of the properties of the object you are animating. If your object is made out of firm material, it will have a little to no squash and stretch. With squash and stretch, we show a character or object's rigidity or flexibility, so be very careful where and how much you use it. For example, a little squash and stretch can be added to the character's head in a walk cycle to loosen up a drawing, but add too much and the head will look like a water balloon. If your character is not made of water, it will look weird as we expect a head to be rigid. This principle lends itself best to the cartoony style of animation, where the characters and their movement can be exaggerated to physically impossible extremes. The more squash and stretch you apply, the more elastic and cartoony the characters will appear. When a cartoon character moves somewhere very quickly, you'll see their whole body stretch in that direction to emphasize the speed. Of course, that squishiness isn't going to feel appropriate on every character especially those who are meant to look more realistic. As an animator, it's important to know when to push this principle further and when to hold back. An object doesn't have to be made of rubber to benefit from squash and stretch. Compression and extension are things our body does all the time. When we jump, we start by squashing down, then we stretch out as we leap into the air. Then we stretch again to prepare to land so that we can squash down once more to absorb the force of the landing. Our facial features even squash and stretch while making expressions, which is something you will frequently see exaggerated in animation. When a character is moving very fast, and there are large gaps in the spacing between each frame, stretching parts of the character in a smeared imitation of motion blur is a handy way to bridge those gaps, allowing your eyes to follow the movement. In certain situations, you can really go crazy with it. Doing so is called a smear frame. With squash and stretch, we want to maintain the volume of the object, while during a smear frame, we are free to change the size of the object as needed to connect frames more fluidly during fast motion. Generally speaking, Squash and stretch is a principle that you don't often see pushed very far in skeletal animation. For a traditional animator, squash and stretch is pretty easy to apply. If you want your character to hit a really stretch out bizarre pose, then you can just draw them that way. In spine, your ability to distort a character's proportions is defined by the skeleton's bones. Those sorts of extremely cartoony deformations can be rather difficult to achieve depending on how you have constructed your skeleton. Even if your skeleton doesn't allow for complex rubbery squishiness, you can still apply this principle in the way the character moves to exaggerate the extension and compression of their body in the poses you make. Don't be afraid to really distort your rig. Use all the tools you have. 
you can translate a bone, scale and shear it to change its shape. If you use Spine Essential and don't have meshes, you can still achieve a lot by just scaling or shearing bones on certain frames. This leads us to a really important point. A lot of animation is about shape changes. If there is no shape change, objects look like rigid cutouts moving around, and in skeletal animation this is something you want to avoid. Changing an object's shape just a little bit will give you a better looking animation in general. So always keep an eye out for a way to achieve this. It can make your characters feel more organic, and using it to exaggerate the extension and compression of your character's body will often lead you to stronger, more visually dynamic poses. Let's apply this principle to a bouncing ball. But to make it more interesting, let's make the ball travel through an obstacle course. If you can animate a ball moving well, you can animate anything. Take your time and think about where there should be the most stretch because of speed and where there should be the most squash because of the force of impact. To see how the bouncing ball exercise can be useful, we will use a common and really helpful workflow. After you have animated your bouncing ball with good timing and spacing, and you've applied squash and stretch, you can transfer that animation to the hips of your character. We're going to use Speedy from the spine example projects. First, if you have separated translate, scale or shear on the ball's bone, be sure to do the same to Speedy's hip bone. Next, select all the keys from the ball, copy them, select Speedy's hip bone and paste. That's half of the job already done. We need to add some poses and that's it. Before I start posing the character, I will uncheck Inherit Rotation and Scale on the head, feet and arms. I don't want the rotation and scale from the hip bone to influence those bones, so I can squash and stretch them individually on different frames. This way, I get more overlap and more interesting animation in general. Everything I'm adding now is just makeup, little overlaps of the head and the body, fixing the arc on the hands and adding follow through on the hair are all just details. They are important as they will add more life and personality to your animation, but the essence of this animation was established with the ball animation. Squash and stretch is definitely one of the most fun principles. It is such a simple concept, but it can bring life to an otherwise stiff animation. For every animation you make, always think about where you can push your squash and stretch more and where you need to stay more subtle. Have fun and happy animating!